Welcome back everyone uh, to the final part of the day one of uh, Sox Knox 6th edition virtual conference and awards. For the final session, we have two wonderful uh, speakers joining us to talk about the technological innovation aspect of how we can control uh, the emissions, how we can control the Sox Knox emissions. So we have uh, Mr. Albert uh, the sales director for Hardik Protective Systems joining us. And apart from that, we have Mr. Ashwani Perswal, who has uh, joined us from United Conveyor Corporation. So here we are going to start with uh, the first uh, presentation uh, that we have. And uh, for that, uh, uh, we would like to start with uh, Mr. Albert, and then we move uh, with uh, Mr. Ashwani Perswal. Over to you, Mr. Albert. Good afternoon. Uh, am I visible and audible to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Perfect. Then um, um, uh, we will be ready to start our presentation uh, in the next minute. Um, uh, please allow us to share our screen. You do have screen sharing access. We request you to yes. please uh, use the front yes. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have started our presentation. Um, can you confirm that it's visible to you? Absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, well, here we go then. Um, we have um, prepared a presentation for you today, which is uh, focused on, a, uh, on an important topic uh, connected to flue gas desulfurization plants for coal-fired power stations. Um, the title of the um, presentation is shown on this slide. Five ideas for reducing the cost and increasing the efficiency of power station FGD chimneys. Um, first of all, I would like to explain why this is a very important topic. Um, of course, when power stations fit flue gas desulfurization equipment, their uh, flue gas uh, temperature becomes very low. So they need a special type of chimneys uh, for in conjunction with these FGD plants. Um, and um, uh, typically these FGD chimneys um, tend to become very expensive and very complex. Um, this presentation um, presents five ideas that will help to reduce the cost of these um, advanced type chimneys. So I will just give a bird's eye view of the uh, five ideas that will be discussed and then I will discuss each of these in more detail. Um, the first of these is to use an FGD wet stack as opposed to uh, a chimney where the flue gas is reheated to a high temperature. The second is to use a specific type of uh, chimney design that has been developed specifically for low temperature FGD operation, which we, we call the new chimney design. The third is to use a specific type of guide vane in the bottom of the chimney that will help to minimize the pressure losses as this uh, low temperature flue gas has to go from a, a horizontal to a vertical flow direction. The fourth idea is what we call a top diffuser, a way to increase the draft and prevent uh, positive pressure inside of these chimneys. And finally, something quite specific to, to our company, uh, uh, a concept which we call the 45 degree high velocity pattern for the lining, which allows these uh, FGD wet stacks 
FGD chimneys to operate at elevated flue gas velocities instead of low flue gas velocities. So these are the five ideas and um, um, I've been informed that we have only 25 minutes to speak about them, but uh, I think that's enough to give you a good impression uh, of each of them. So here we go with um, idea number one, the so-called FGD wet stack. And on this picture, you can see a traditional layout of uh, a flue gas desulfurization absorber with an FGD outlet duct leading towards a chimney, um, an FGD chimney. And uh, many of our customers around the world use reheating systems. The, uh, the flue gas that comes out of the absorber typically is around 50 to 60 degrees Celsius after the desulfurization process. And uh, many customers uh, traditionally have opted to use reheating system that will um, uh, increase, boost the temperature of the gas flow from 50 to typically 80 to 100 degrees C. And then it enters the uh, chimney in a more or less dry fashion. The wet stack, of course, is the simplified version of that, where we no longer use any reheating system and the flue gas goes directly from the FGD absorber through a duct straight into the chimney. This is the wet stack concept, no more reheat. First of all, um, I would like to sum up the most important advantages of using an FGD wet stack. And of course, obviously, the first one is that the reheater equipment is eliminated. So uh, any form of reheater that you might have used, uh, be it a rotating gas gas heater or a steam pipe gas reheater, uh, it is no longer needed. So your investment in this equipment, uh, which can be several millions of US dollars, is, uh, is eliminated. Very importantly also, as you could already see in the pictures, the ductwork geometry is uh, much more simple and straightforward. Uh, not, it's no longer necessary to run the ductwork through the reheating equipment. It can go straight from the absorber to the chimney. Again, a savings uh, that is very significant. Now, the third saving is something that customers maybe in some cases tend to overlook, uh, but it is a saving in operational cost for the power plant. Um, when, a f when a power plant uses flue gas reheating, it needs to push the uh, flue gas stream through the reheater on its way to the chimney. In many cases, it, it goes through the reheater two times, one time as a hot gas before the absorber to be cooled down, and again as a clean gas downstream of the absorber to be warmed up. All of this passing through the reheater leads to great pressure losses, and these have to be compensated by the booster fan. Um, and so this booster fan will use a lot of auxiliary power uh, as a result of running the reheat system. And of course, going to a wet stack eliminates this power use completely. So it really reduces the operating cost of the power plant over the whole 30 year lifetime that is typically projected for, for the FGD system. Now, um, about FGD wet stack, um, it is not only good news, there is also a challenge in operating an FGD wet stack, which is um, uh, the, the environmental um, uh, risk of spitting. So um, uh, when you run an FGD wet stack, there is always condensation uh, uh, present within the chimney. And uh, if the stack is not properly engineered, uh, for, for proper flue gas velocity and detailing, this uh, liquid can be blown out of the top of the chimney. It is called spitting, and it's a very an, um, unpleasant problem for the power plant itself and for the community surrounding the power plant. So this should be carefully avoided. Other than that, the FGD wet stack is clearly 
the way to go and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, our, our projects that we are currently doing in India where we are supplying the lining and the auxiliaries um, the, um, these customers are indeed already using wet stacks. I would like to quickly move on to the next savings idea, which is what we call the new chimney design. In this picture, you can see an FGD absorber and an outlet duct, and you can see an, an open uh, model, typical uh, um, um, uh, design of a traditional chimney, where you see a concrete shell, and inside of the concrete shell is a steel flue. The steel flea flue contains the, uh, the, the flue gas and the concrete shell is actually only for one thing, to support the steel flue and to be resistant against high winds. There is a better way, which is the new chimney design. And here we see the schematic view of that. Um, what is the new chimney design? It is quite simply a chimney where the steel flue has been eliminated and where the lining is glued directly to the inside of the concrete shell. Here you see how that goes. Typically, uh, the, the lining system, our, our company is a supplier of borosilicate glass block lining systems. Typically, the lining system is glued to the inside of the concrete shell um, at a thickness of 51 millimeters. 51 millimeter for the block, 3 millimeter for the adhesive. Typically, a 54 millimeter thick lining, which protects this concrete from um, um, uh, acid, acid flue gas, but also protects it from thermal stress. So what are the advantages of using the new chimney design? First of all, the construction cost is reduced by at least 30%. So your total cost of this very expensive item, the, the, the low temperature FGD chimney is reduced by 30%. It's, it's a huge cost saving. Secondly, and very importantly, uh, using the new chimney design also reduces the construction time for the chimney. Uh, as we know very well, and, and I think it is a central theme of, uh, of, of, of our um, seminar today, uh, the um, FGD retrofit projects in India are under very strong time constraints with, uh, with definite uh, deadlines already looming. And um, what we see on our projects, not only in India, but worldwide, is that the construction of steel flues takes a, a huge amount of time. Um, by um, uh, eliminating the steel flue uh, out of the construction process, uh, we can save around five months. It is, of course, uh, again, uh, like with most good ideas, like with the wet stack, uh, there is not only good news, there are also challenges. And um, uh, we would like to summarize that there are some very important requirements for the new chimney design. Number one, um, it is important to engineer it in such a way that the vertical crack width is always less than 0 0.2 millimeters. Because if vertical cracks are allowed to appear that are more than 0 0.2 millimeters, then from the outside, rainwater and humidity can reach the steel reinforcement and the uh, concrete chimney will be attacked. It will corrode and its lifetime will be reduced. So this is very important. Um, also, what is also very important is that the shape of the uh, new chimney design chimney should always be as much as possible cylindrical or um, entirely cylindrical, if at all possible. The reason is that um, if traditional engineering guidelines are followed and um, uh, a conical chimney is built, then Number one, there will be a lot of additional lining material needed in the chimney, which is expensive. 
But even more importantly, the pressure losses in the chimney will be very great and it will lead to uh, uh, high um, power use in the uh, booster fans throughout the life of the FGD system. So these are two very important engineering per, uh, um, uh, requirements. Uh, also for new chimney design to be used successfully, the borosilicate lining has to meet the highest quality standards. Um, at the end of this presentation, I will speak uh, a little bit in more detail about the quality requirements that should be imposed on any borosilicate lining uh, in any chimney, but certainly in the new chimney design itself. Now I would like to move to the third idea, which is the wet ready guide vane. Um, and this guide vane has been developed especially for FGD wet stacks. So, of course, guide vanes are extremely important uh, in order to reduce turbulence and reduce pressure losses inside of the chimney. Here we see, of course, how guide vanes, what they typically look like. Um, uh, they are simply um, uh, rounded um, uh, sections of, of a resistant type of steel, uh, which will uh, guide the flue gas as it goes from a horizontal to a vertical flow direction. Now, the problem with guide vanes, um, especially in wet stacks, is that you cannot use a traditional guide vein in a wet stack because the liquid droplets will, will collect on the guide vein and then they will be shot from the top of the guide vein into the flue gas and they will cause very strong spitting of the chimney. That is the problem that uh, I was speaking about um, um, uh, during ID1 for the wet stack. So um, it's very important to use a guide vane, but actually in a wet stack you cannot use any guide vanes. And uh, on many of our wet stack projects, um, the owners have had to um, uh, forego the use of guide vanes and so they are faced necessarily with these high pressure losses. Now we have developed a better solution. It is called the wet ready guide vane and you can see it here. Um, what it is, is basically a guide vane which is shaped like an airplane wing. It is highly optimized for reduced pressure losses and it does something else as well that's very important. It catches the droplets that lands on its surface and then these droplets are eliminated in an orderly fashion through slits at the top and the bottom of the guide vane. This is a patented design and um, uh, it's very effective in uh, reducing pressure losses in the wet stack, but also in catching and uh, orderly disposal of liquids. The advantages of the wet ready guide vane can be summarized as follows. The pressure losses going from horizontal to vertical are reduced by approximately 250 Pascal, uh, which is, uh, if, you, if you translate that into reduced power consumption by the booster fans, is a very significant uh, 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 cost reduction, uh, running cost reduction for the power plant, uh, by which the, the guide vane will pay itself back over the life of the plant uh, num a number of times. Also, as I had said, it minimizes the escape of acid droplets into the gas flow. The fourth idea was the top diffuser. Uh, and I'd like to describe to you now what that is all about. Now, again, we are talking about a wet stack mostly. And um, we have to consider that um, when a wet stack is built in India, the thermal difference between the ambient air and the cool flue gas is not big. Typically, the flue gas in a wet stack will be only around 55 degrees Celsius and uh, the ambient temperature can be easily in India 45 degrees Celsius. So, Due to this very low temperature difference, the natural draft in FGD wet stacks is uh, very reduced. And 
one um, uh, negative side effect of that is that um, very often the flue gas has to be actively uh, pumped through the chimney and um, uh, positive pressure can occur throughout the chimney and suddenly, certainly in the top of that chimney. And that is what we are showing here um, in this chimney. Uh, this is, of course, we are using the example of an FGD, a new chimney design. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the flue gas uh, is, is uh, it's developing positive pressure. This is the solution, which is to open up the top of the chimney uh, under an angle of eight degrees uh, over a height of 15 meters. This, uh, this uh, solution was developed together with our engineering partners in Germany, company Constructure. And as a result of that, the um, uh, positive pressure will be avoided and the draft of the chimney will strongly increase. So clearly, to make the top of the chimney like this is an added investment, but uh, again, a very profitable investment for the power plant. So the first advantage of the top diffuser is the prevention of positive pressure inside of the chimney. And uh, also here again, we have a reduction of pressure losses by around 116 Pascal. Put in a different way, um, when we have a chimney of 150 meters high, which is a typical height for FGD wet stacks, um, by doing the diffuser, actually the draft in the chimney will be the same as for a 240 meter high chimney. So rather than going to the expense of building an extra high chimney, which clearly is very costly, um, the, the use of the diffuser will give the same uh, increase in draft for uh, a fraction of that cost. I'm coming already to idea number five, uh, which is uh, a concept that was developed by our company and, and recently introduced to the market, which we call the 45 degree high velocity pattern for our lining system. Here we have our borosilicate glass block lining system in its traditional form. And we see that uh, the, the glass blocks are glued to the wall of the chimney in an upright fashion. This is what we call the staggered pattern. Um, as per the uh, recommendations of the uh, EPRI, US uh, Electric Power Research Institute, the velocity in these chimneys should not be more than 60 feet per second, 18.3 meters per second, because if we go above 18.3 meters per second, the liquid will not flow down reliably from the wall. Instead, it will be re-entrained, and then we get, of course, the, the very um, uh, concerning spitting problem. Uh, here we see as a theoretical possibility, if we would run a normal lined wet stack at 20 meters per second, we would see increasing re-entrainment of acid droplets and they would fly out of the top of the stack. This is the solution that has been developed. It is called the 45 degree high velocity pattern. And um, it is a, a solution where the blocks are glued under an angle. Um, our technical team has uh, has developed the way to do this and uh, now very soon in India the first project will start where um, the uh, the lining is glued under this 45 degree angle now what that uh, what that offers as an advantage is that the draining down of the liquid from the inside of the chimney is far better and now the chimney can operate at flue gas velocities of up to 22.9 meter per second uh, while still uh, safely draining down the flue gas. So this is quite um, um, a game changing uh, improvement for borosilicate glass block linings where um, uh, they can be used at higher velocities. We, we do not longer have the 18.3 meter per second uh, limitation. We can go substantially higher than that. Now, of course, um, um, as, as a skeptical um, uh, question, you might ask, why would we do this? We can simply build a chimney 
um, that will operate at 18.3 meter per second maximum and that's that and the problem is solved but actually uh, we have we have identified several cases where this 45 degree high velocity pattern is a, a very welcome and sometimes necessary improvement we think this technology should be considered for existing chimneys with high flue gas velocities. We do have customers who want to reuse their existing chimneys um, uh, as FGD wet stacks because it's economically very attractive, but the velocities are on the higher side and they cannot stick to 18.3 meter per second. For these chimneys, in many cases, using the 45 degree high velocity pattern is the right solution um, we um, i was just mentioning our first project in india with 45 degree uh, hvp pattern and um, this is indeed an existing chimney with flue gas velocities in the range of up to 21 to 22 meter per second thanks to the 45 degree pattern um, this chimney can be reused safely as a wet stack Secondly, the second um, uh, case where uh, this should be considered is chimneys where increased gas volumes can occur. So uh, definitely true that um, uh, many of our customers develop chimneys for a design velocity of 18.3 meters per second. However, um, when they also consider um, um, uh, the maximum design velocity uh, with the worst coal, often we see that the gas volume increases tremendously. And in those cases, which are uh, re realistic operating scenarios, the uh, velocity goes up from 18 meter to 19, 20, even higher. And um, for those cases, um, it is useful to also consider this solution in order to be uh, to reduce the risk also for those specific operating scenarios. And finally, we also see that in many cases, uh, chimneys have unstable gas entry velocities. So, uh, for example, if the ductwork uh, is geometry is such that uh, the flue gas is faster on one side and slower on the other side of the chimney, clearly we recommend to engineer for the worst case and also to use this solution so this was the fifth idea now i will go to uh, summarizing the economical impact and first i would like to focus on the capex impact of using these design changes and and here they are we have simply um, uh, added up the five solutions some are an immediate cost reduction Others require uh, uh, an additional investment, but if the five ideas are used, the total saving of the um, uh, FGD retrofit will be well over $4 million. And that is only the investment cost. Even more important is the uh, operating uh, uh, cost reduction. Uh, of course, uh, as I had explained, wet stack, wet ready guide fame, um, uh, they all uh, help to reduce the operating cost of the power plant. And um, our projection is that for a 600 megawatt plant, the operating cost reduction can be between one and a half and $2 million a year. Now, of course, if we multiply that by 30, it is a very significant cost reduction. Before I conclude this presentation, um, I would like to spend a, a quick word on um, borosilicate lining materials and the quality of these that need to be assured in order for um, uh, reliability and long-term success. Clearly, we have seen that uh, some uh, companies has entered this market with uh, very uh, keen pricing and um, uh, contractors uh, who are under cost pressures will typically prefer to, to uh, use these types of systems. Um, we recommend to all owners to insist that the lining system has a proven track record in the same operating conditions because one type of chimney and another type of chimney can be quite different from one another. So um, definitely we recommend to 
uh, to insist on a track record that where the same fuel type is used, the same coal, the same FGD type is used. So wet limestone, seawater, it doesn't matter. Please make sure that it is the same and that the gas temperature and humidity are also the same. Unfortunately, we have seen uh, some cases where, um, where suppliers are trying to offer uh, a lining system that is not well prepared for operating under high humidity conditions, uh, and they do not have any track record uh, in wet stacks, and still they are recommending their system, of course, at a low cost. So we warn against that. Secondly, we recommend that every lining system must have acceptable wet stack properties. It has to be tested and confirmed suitable. Um, here we have written tested and confirmed by Alden Research Laboratory. That is a testing institute in the United States with whom we have worked uh, for many years who have quite a central role in this wet stack technology. They have worked with EPRI and uh, definitely we, rec re we recommend that any candidate system has to be tested. And finally, um, we do recommend that any supplier of borosilicate glass lining systems have to have a proven track record for on-site QA inspections in large scale applications. The reason is that it doesn't matter if you use a very good material. Uh, if the application is not done in the correct way, the result will still be terrible. So um, um, our philosophy is that we should always supply a very high quality material together with very high quality uh, technical support by our own QA inspectors on the project sites. That's what we are doing worldwide and, and also on our projects in India. So I come to the conclusion. Um, we have shown five ideas. And um, so if, if owners implement these five ideas, and of course we are always ready to help and advise, um, the chimneys and the whole FGD system becomes lower cost and faster to build. So that is the first immediate benefit, but also more efficient during operation. Uh, a lot of cost can be saved by operating chimneys efficiently and implementing modern efficient designs. And finally, these chimneys can be made environmentally safer. Of course, community relations nowadays for, for coal-fired power plants are very, very important uh, by engineering the chimney well to operate as a safe wet stack, um, uh, these community relations can be protected very well. This was the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I have stayed within the speaking time. I believe that I have. And uh, of course, uh, I would welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Albert, for the wonderful presentation and uh, going through it in quite a detail where <laughs> Uh, I request all the attendees to please uh, share your questions if you have any, and uh, we'll be more than happy to pass it on to Albert. Before uh, that, uh, I will request uh, our next speaker. I do have his uh, presentation recorded. So next speaker is Mr. Ashwini Perswal, joining us from United Conveyor Corporation. And here we start with this presentation. Stop on my chair. Paul. Um, I am representing a company named United Conveyor Corporation. Uh, we are based in Chicago, US. Um, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't have a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, in fact, I was in India a couple of weeks back with the hope that I would be able to see all of you and attend this uh, fantastic conference. But nevertheless, uh, let's have the virtual meeting and a successful one. Uh, I'm recording in advance just to be sure that we do not have technical glitch at the last moment. So I'll begin by thanking uh, Mission Energy uh, for this uh, wonderful event that they have been organizing for last uh, few years. I've had an opportunity to attend it face to face in 2019. Uh, it was a great event, uh, met a lot of people, like-minded people who, who are really conscious and uh, want to get rid of all the pollutants that are hurting the, the environment and will definitely be a problem for generations going forward. 
So United Conveyor Corporation has also been <clears throat> successfully doing uh, uh, several projects and had taken up this initiative <clears throat> more than 15 years back uh, as part of the whole concept of uh, uh, getting rid of the pollutants. Uh, we started with ash handling, then moved into uh, the environmental control uh, topics and got in this DSI uh, business more than uh, 18 years back now. So I will give a presentation on the technology. I've given that in past also. Uh, so should we start? I am going to share my screen. All right. So, like I said, United Conveyor Corporation. Uh, give me a second. Yes. Yeah. So, we are more than a hundred year old company. Uh, we started operations sometime in 1919. Uh, it's, this is now 101st year. Last year was our centennial year. Unfortunately, we couldn't have a gala celebration because of the COVID break uh, in the United States. Uh, so UCC had been pioneer uh, in ash handling systems. That's how the uh, company started. It's a family owned company uh, into third generation uh, handling this uh, business. We have more than 3,500, uh, almost close to 3,800 global installations in uh, ash handling systems, hundreds and hundreds of patents uh, in the technology. We almost have 80 to 90% of the North American market and a very, very strong presence in uh, uh, almost uh, 60 or more than 60 countries. UCC has handled many, many products and uh, completed, uh, whether it's a pneumatic conveying system or a hydraulic system uh, for uh, ash handling, coal, dust, petrochemical. And like I mentioned, almost 18, 20 years back, we got into the dry sorbent injection systems. That was the time when EPA had come up with very stringent norms uh, during Obama era. And most of the plants were told to either shut down if they do not have a <coughs> wet FGD installed or install a wet FGD and then they would they were allowed to run the plants for uh, five, 10 years, depending upon the norms. So most of the plants, because of the uh, schedule constraints and the balanced life left, decided to go for uh, dry sorbent injection systems. The technology was new. So new concepts came in as to how to prove the, the worth of this technology. And uh, I'll, I'll go into details of how we finally entered in it. This is uh, a lab that we have in our uh, Chicago office. Uh, this is the biggest lab with, the, with a full-scale test loop. Uh, this is biggest in world for any pneumatic conveying testing. Um, we have thousands of samples available that we test worldwide. Uh, now let's get to the SO2 emission topic. Uh, uh, so this is this is a picture that I stole from uh, NASA website, and uh, it really hurts to see what kind of uh, SO2 levels are shown for India. India kind of uh, leads in this. Uh, I hope in last few years, because of all the measures that Indian government has taken, these numbers will start coming down. Uh, but right now there's a huge need to, to bring down all the pollutants, whether it is SOX, NOx, or uh, associated pollutants like SO3, HFHCl, so the future can live in peace. Talking about DSI, like I said, the uh, initially because the technology was new, that was 20 years back, a uh, lot of plants opted for uh, Mobile systems, you see a picture uh, in this slide uh, with a 40 foot trailer and a mobile silo installed. So those plants had these mobile systems installed on rental basis for six months to a year. Uh, thousands and thousands of uh, 
measurements and data points were collected to prove the effectiveness of the DSI system in uh, reducing SO2 and SO3. So those days we had uh, done more than 50 uh, permanent installations and uh, almost 100 plus uh, full-scale demonstrations uh, of the systems. We, as of today, have more than 160 installations in the United States. Now we have expanded into European market. So I'll go to remove, SO2 removal basics. Uh, most of you know by now uh, that there are very, various technologies that are available worldwide for SO2 removal. The most common is uh, wet FGD systems, uh, which use uh, a different concept, uh, but can bring the reduction down to almost 99% level. Uh, that's a different kind of solution, expensive one, uh, very long lead time, but we are not into that. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on the dry solvent injection. So for dry solvent injection, uh, especially for SO2 removal, there are three types of uh, uh, reagents that can be used for injection into duct. Uh, we start with trona. Trona is uh, basically C sodium CQ carbonate. It's available in the United States in abundance. Then comes uh, sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate, you know, it's it's chemically produced. Uh, it's basically caustic soda that we use in every Indian household. Uh, and then it's uh, hydrated lime. Uh, I'm not gonna touch on trauna uh, for the reason that trauna mines are not in India. They are only in US, a lot of mines in China and very few of them in Turkey. So Indian market is more uh, going to focus on sodium bicarbonate, which is abundantly available uh, with several chemical companies like Tata Chemicals, Nirma, GHPCL, and, and many other companies are supplying sodium bicarbonate. Anybody making soda ash makes sodium bicarbonate. And then hydrated lime. Uh, there's a specific grade of hydrated lime that we use. I'll go in details of that. So depending on the temperature and the application, we we pick a solvent. Uh, so if the re removal requirements are moderate to high, which means more than 50%, less than 90%, uh, we go for SPC. If removal requirements are low, close to 50, 60%, uh, then hydrated lime is also a good solution, but we generally prefer that uh, they have uh, fabric filters uh, installed as against an ESP or the ESP should be large enough. So, like I said, different temperatures uh, govern the criteria of where to inject, what to inject. Sodium bicarbonate is uh, uh, best reacted at temperatures between 150 to 345 degrees. You can stretch it to like 348 degrees centigrade also. So this is a temperature at which the calcination process is more effective. Um, and uh, it, it calcines into porous sodium carbonate, uh, a bigger surface area and uh, better decomposition is achieved. We call it popcorn effect uh, in the duct. So the more surface area it covers, the, the better the re reaction is. That's why these temperatures play a very, very prominent role. Then comes hydrated lime. Hydrated lime, it's a, it's a vast range, 65 to 600 degrees C and uh, it can be injected at air preheater inlet, outlet, closer to ESP, but definitely we need some residence time for uh, both the solvents and we just cannot inject it at the inlet of ESP. So what, this is a microscopic view of the look of solvent after it has gone through a certain temperature, you will see that uh, how the porosity of a solvent changes uh, at different temperatures. When SPC is sodium bicarbonate, if it is at, uh, like you see, 400 degrees C, uh, the particle porosity is very different. and It, it almost loses all its porosity 
as compared to when it's at a, we call it sweet spot, which is 150 to 345 degrees C. The more porous it is, the better reaction, better decomposition that happens. And like I said, the popcorn effect takes place. This is what you see when the temperatures are below 150 and it's, it's, it's crystalline. So the reaction is gonna be extremely poor. It's a very low surface area. So the solvent requirement will be very, very high as compared to when it is in that sweet spot of temperature. <clears throat> this is a graph that we plotted based on, like I said, thousands and thousands of data we collected. In fact, the data collection has gone into millions because we were at site for months and months and every we, we were plotting data for every minute, every five minute, every 10 minute, which went on for months and years. So UCC has a huge data bank of how reaction happens at a different temperature. So all that is plotted into our system uh, intelligent system to help come up with NSR. Sometimes some, some of our uh, esteemed uh, partners and customers, we have, a, we have a healthy debate with them on NSR calculations. And we do tell them that, yes, there is a formula, but uh, it, they, you just cannot go with that formula because uh, the experience also comes in play. You just cannot have a 100% reaction of solvent and that's how the NSR formula uh, works. Uh, so if you notice here, it's uh, it shows trauma, sodium bicarbonate, and then unmilled trauma, uh, how it behaves. So SO2 removal percentage, it's best with uh, sodium bicarbonate and that to milled sodium bicarbonate, you, you will notice it, it goes up to like 95% and we do have plants, a bigger plants with that kind of reduction that we achieved. Um, but it consumes a lot and a lot of solvent. And sometimes uh, that may not be a viable solution unless the plant is kind of struggling to meet a deadline and uh, they, they really have to go for it. Uh, so some of the plants in US did do that and we were very successful with those uh, installations. Otherwise, uh, uh, the, the best installation is the one where you are trying to reduce anywhere between 70 to 75 and 80% max uh, of uh, SO2. This is a graph that we plotted for hydrated lime. Hydrated lime, uh, the injection rates of hydrated lime are almost two to three times of sodium bicarbonate. That's why we always uh, say that uh, it's prefer you have a bag house then an ESP, or even if you have an ESP, it should be a, a larger ESP because the amount of lime injection, uh, the, the, the size of ESP should be able to take that uh, amount of lime injection. Hydrated lime that we have used, uh, there are different kinds of hydrated limes used in US, uh, made by Alhais, it's called Sorbacal, SPS, uh, Mississippi Lime also makes. They have a very good, very high porosity, high surface area, and uh, highly pure. Uh, so these also have their own uh, chemistry wherein they, they put additives and uh, sodium is one of the additive that they put. Uh, the advantage of putting sodium as an additive and for that matter, SPC is that surface resistivity of ash decreases when you have sodium as a additive. So the performance of ESP in fact improves. These are different test results, uh, again, based on the data that we collected from different installations, milled trauma, unmilled trauma. So you, you will notice the, the biggest thing that you will notice is that if a product is milled and is below 40, 45 microns, the, the solvent consumption is very low and the reaction is extremely good. So that's why we always tell customers to, to go with milled solvent injected into the ducts. So you would buy a solvent which is unmilled around 350 microns or so, but UCC's own patented mills, and I'll get to those mills design, they, uh, reduce it down to under 40 microns. 
this shows uh, again solvent usage with uh, different uh, technologies uh, in the sense that different solvents. So you will notice that SPC is the one, sodium bicarbonate is the one which, is, which has the lowest requirement for SO2 removal. Let's get to the system design basics. It's a, it's a very simple system for that matter. Um, it requires a space for a 210 megawatt, like I would say 25 meters by 25 meters. Um, it's silos. Then you, you need to install prime movers, your blowers, heat exchangers, um, mills. The mills, like I said, they break down the particles. Uh, then a truck unloading or a bag unloading system uh, and a PLC control system. So you will notice from those these pictures how compact the design is and it can be accommodate, accommodated into any very, very old plant which really is struggling to find space to install a system. A different kind of concepts, you can have one or two piece design we call Silos, our silos have a, have a UCC owned technology of, or a design of uh, discharge. We call it chisel button. Uh, UCC has extremely good experience with chisel button designs, uh, wherein it's easy to get the solvent out from the um, hopper and feed into the line. This picture uh, shows you how compact the design is. In fact, for the mobile systems, it was all put in a container like the prime mover, mills, and then it is fed into the ducts. This is a mill building concept. This is again a, a sectional view of how material, how the equipments are installed when it's a mobile system that we call. Uh, it's a 40 foot container that we use we install a mill, prime movers, a small compressor for instrument air requirements, receiver, and a section for a PLC control system. These are uh, compact uh, hydrated lime injection systems. So for a very small plant, like a, a captive power plant, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 megawatts, so these uh, compact systems are used in US. Let's get to another part of the technology, which is also very critical and heart of the system. Uh, these are splitters and lances. So what, what happens is when the material comes out of the uh, mill, it goes through a single pipeline. And as we get closer to the duct, let's say we are injecting at air preheater inlet, uh, we pick several locations at air preheater inlet and we inject, we put a in product called, we call it lances. We have different designs. We call it Cobra lens because it spreads like Cobra when it gets into the Cobra wings, when it gets into the uh, duct. And uh, as a result, it, there's a vortex being formed and the spread is very uniform. The Because we are converting one line to almost six or 12 lances, we use a splitter which splits one line to six, eight, 12, like I said. And the, the distribution has to be uniform. Pressure drop has to be uniform. Temperatures have to be uniform. So UCC has spent years and years in perfecting that design. Uh, it comes with auto purge systems and different instrumentation processes to, to tell the people operating from PLC how the system is behaving and performing. This is a CFD modeling that shows uh, how a standard common lens and a Cobra lens would differ when it comes to dispersion of material in the duct. CFD modeling is done for every project we install and we strongly recommend a customer to do that. That's how we give guarantees. With CFD modeling, we plot millions and millions of data uh, with gas flow, residence time, uh, and pick the right spots where the Cobra lenses should be inserted inside the duct. So we have a uniform distribution and we get enough residence time for the perfect reaction. Like I said, the heart of uh, a solvent injection system is mills. UCC has 
two specific mill designs. One caters up to three tons, and the second one caters up to seven tons capacity. Uh, these mills run at very high speed, almost at 4,000 RPM. And these are inline mills. When I say inline mills, uh, we never recommend, and based on our experience, a customer to mill the solvent and then store it. It just doesn't work. We have been replacing many systems done by uh, our competitors uh, in US where they have these where the customer is facing huge problems. And in fact, we have been busy, very busy last two years fixing those plants because there are no new plants coming up. So, so sorry about that. So what happens is uh, as the material enters these mills uh, and they're rotating at uh, 4,000 RPM, the cutter blocks that are installed inside the mill uh, those cutter blocks, they break the particles from almost 350 microns to 40 microns and under 40 microns. Uh, and then since it's an inline system, it straight away goes to the line and then conveys to the uh, duct. These are some case studies of uh, different plants that we have installations about. Like I mentioned, we have done bigger projects. We have even done an 800 megawatt unit. This installation tells you that we achieved up to like 90% production for solvent, for, I'm sorry, for SO2. This is another installation like I was telling about 800 megawatt. It is, the plant is named Powerton Station. And we were successful in uh, achieving almost 90% SO2 removal. picture of a system that we installed for mobile. These are different uh, plants that we commissioned up till 2017, 2018. Uh, in fact, after 2018, we got, because there were no new plants coming up, all the plants who wanted to install a system they had installed by 2018 and rest of the plants decided either they're gonna just shut the plant down within two, two to three years, or uh, will install a mobile system or find a different uh, alternate, which means uh, go back to EPA and try to get more time. But unfortunately, most of them were unsuccessful. So some of those plants are now closing down. Uh, but uh, what, what I was trying to get to was uh, from 2018 up till today, we have been very busy uh, with the uh, big projects of renovation and modernization, what I call, which means uh, a, a DSI plant was supplied by one of our competition and customer was suffering big time, uh, very high solvent consumption or a lot of outages. They were not able to operate it successfully. Availability was very poor. So UCC was called to fix those systems and we have been doing that. This is another plant where we supplied uh, three wiper mills, very high capacity mills. Another system for 400 megawatt. This is another inline mill. This shows uh, chisel bottom, tall silos. These are all skirted silos closed because of the uh, weather requirements where in, the, in some states temperatures go like minus 20 degrees C. This is a UCC wiper mill uh, installed like five years. Uh, now it's like more than six years back. Uh, this is again a microscopic view of, uh, like I was telling you about unmilled and milled solvent. Uh, so we generally get unmilled as we see, which is close to 350 microns and we mill it to under 40 microns. Uh, the purpose of that is to get better reaction, uh, better residence time, uh, and reduced solvent consumption. This, this shows all the different data that we plot and then see what, what's, the, what's the sweet spot and what kind of NSR do we get for a, dip, for a specific reduction requirement. Uh, this is... Uh, an excerpt of the, the first plant that we installed in India. 
So the first plant uh, that came up that was ordered in India was uh, end, of, end of 2018 by NTPC. Uh, we have successfully supplied and commissioned four, for four units of 210 megawatt. Uh, NTPC is reducing uh, six, uh, the SO2 from, I believe, 1280 to 560 or 580 milligrams, uh, almost 60 to 67 percent reduction. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, they have not been able to run the plants uh, sex, like successfully for last three years, the, the power plant because of the power requirement. But whenever they run the plants, because they are just bordering Delhi, they have to run with DSI systems. So for last two and a half, two years, they have been successfully running all the four units with DSI uh, systems. Uh, that that's all for now. Uh, this is the presentation I had to share with you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. And I will also be attending this virtual conference. Uh, Here was uh, the conclusion for uh, Mr. Perswal's uh, presentation. Now I would request both the gentlemen to join us uh, if they can turn on their video and audio. Wonderful. So now uh, we are at the end of uh, day one and I would request uh, to all the delegates if they have any questions, please feel free to ask to our, uh, to our dignitaries, to our esteemed speakers. Please feel free to raise hands and we'll invite you on stage to directly ask questions to Mr. Albert and Mr. Ashton. Okay, looks like we do not have any direct questions. What we'll do is post-conference, if we receive any question, we'll compile and share that with you, with both of uh, the professionals over the mail, so that you can revert back as per your convenience and we can uh, push it to the, the, the delegates who have uh, asked the questions. So here on this note, we end the day one of the conference and I would really like to thank Mr. Albert and Mr. Ashwini joining us from different parts of the world and taking the time out from their hectic schedule in different time zones. Thank you so much for joining us. We, uh, we are really happy to have your presence and really look forward to your future participation and future conferences. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks for the invite. Here we end the day one and we move forward. Uh, we'll, I'll be looking forward with, to all the delegates joining us tomorrow for day two of the conference and would request Mr. Perswal and Mr. Albert to join us if they wish to. We're more than happy to have their presence. Thank you so much.